I am honored uh, to introduce John Nichols and of course, Prime Minister Jakob's daughter. Um, I think as we reimagine America, we would be wise to look out at the world. And I can't think of anyone I'd rather hear from today. Prime Minister Jakob's daughter came to the nation, inspired us all at a fraught moment. This is another. So I look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much for making time in your schedule. John Nichols. John Nichols is uh, the nation's inimitable national affairs correspondent, author of too many books to note, but his most recent book, The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, is a fascinating biography of Henry Wallace and his anti-fascist, anti-racist policies, and it couldn't be more relevant for, day, for today. John uh, is a media reform guru. He founded Free Press. He writes for many places, including uh, Madison's Cap Times. He's always on the road. These times have been challenging for him, but he has learned how to be the master Zoomer. And I would just say he is a great, great friend to the magazine. Uh, if we were on sea, at sea, he'd be the master cruiser. He's a great friend uh, to me and a counselor and knows everything if you get him going on history, not just about America, but about the world. So thank you, John, for Prime Minister, for being part of this uh, first ever virtual festival. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, I believe that we are we are linked up. I hope so. We're doing all this through Zoom, so it's quite a, a new adventure for us, but uh, a great honor to be here today with Prime Minister Katrin Jakobsdottir of Iceland. Uh, at the age of 41 in 2017, uh, Katrin Jakobsdottir led her party, the Left Green Movement, uh, into government and winning a election fight and then forging a cross-party coalition that uh, really did usher in a new era in Iceland and also positioned her as someone uh, that the whole world was watching. She very quickly became one of the leading voices on climate justice and also on gender equity. And since COVID-19 has hit not just Iceland, but the whole of the world, she's emerged as a steady and very effective leader in dealing with all the social and economic issues that have extended from the crisis. Uh, she is as well a uh, expert on Nordic crime fiction uh, who lectures and speaks on uh, these matters uh, to this day uh, when she has a, a moment from governing. And she is uh, the current chair, I believe, of the council, I hope I, I wanna make sure I have this right, uh, the Council of Women World Leaders, uh, which is a group that uh, has been of special note and special attention of late uh, because women leaders have been some of the most effective uh, responders to the coronavirus pandemic and to the challenges extending from it. So Prime Minister Jakob Stotter, thank you so much for joining us uh, for the Nation Festival. Well, thank you, John. It's great meeting you again. And, and thank you for your very warm words in your introduction. Uh, in Iceland, we really don't know how to make, take a compliment. So <laughs> I find this all very awkward. <laughs> uh, I, I completely understand. And as a Northern Midwesterner in the United States, we, we brought the, some of those uh, traditions to, to our country as well. So we, we can be embarrassed together. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, in the Icelandic sagas, people never made compliments. So, <laughs> not at all. Figure this out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's same in the Midwest. So, we're, we're in good, good company, but we've got a lot of people from around the United States and even around the world who are joining us today. And, um, and I know that they're excited to, to hear from you. And I wanted to begin by uh, talking about the, the one thing that sadly the whole world has in common at this point, which is COVID-19 and mm -hmm. the challenges of the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, tell me, how, how do things stand in Iceland today? In the United States, obviously, we're really dealing with a resurgence of the crisis and, and a great many challenges. Um, I'm interested in opening up with just a perspective on where things stand in, in your country. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree, you know, this crisis, this pandemic is really 
uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it's a real crisis, not just a health crisis, it's also an economic crisis. Yes. Uh, and the situation in Iceland right now is actually that we are on the right track. Uh, we've had uh, this year uh, 26 people dying from COVID in Iceland and around 5,200 confirmed cases uh, and out of them 300 people admitted to hospital. So, and you must remember that we are a nation of 360,000 people. Um, um, but I think actually from right now, we you know we are seeing fewer and fewer cases each day. We are under uh, strict controls with a limit of 10 people and two meters distancing in the whole country. But the schools are running. Uh, kids are actually starting to go to sports today again. My sons actually really looked forward to this day because they haven't been able to attend sports uh, for the last few weeks. So we are loosening very slowly uh, on restriction, uh, but, but it's been a tough year. And I think we have actually been going through this pandemic really by, with a great cooperation with our scientists and public health experts. So we have managed really to to uh, do enough to contain the virus. But obviously we've had our losses too, like everybody. Iceland uh, got a lot of note around the world uh, because of some innovative uh, focus on testing and tracing and, yeah. and really models that, that other countries have studied, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Yeah, we've been doing extensive testing. Uh, we've been using the methods of contact tracing, uh, both um, by using a tracing app, which people can actually voluntarily download and use, but also just by using the good old telephone and calling people and saying, where were you? <laughs> because <laughs> we have reason to believe that there was a COVID infected person there. And that it has helped, obviously, that we're a small country. So, so we have managed to use the tracing uh, methods very effectively and then quarantine and isolation. And uh, actually, you know, my son actually went to quarantine with his father. And I think every family in Iceland has had some experience of these methods. But they have worked and we have followed the guidelines of the, the WHO. And we have had also a very good cooperation between... Uh, our health expert, you know, public health experts, but also scientists, freelance scientists, private corporations. So I think actually you can say that, you know, whether you look to the, our health system or our or our scientists, everybody just put everything else aside and said this is going to be our number one priority, and that's what people have been doing here ever since February, and and I, I, we owe a lot to those people actually. Mm. In the United States, uh, the response to the pandemic has been very political. Uh, people have been divided, uh, even on issues of whether to wear masks, whether to follow the protocols. Has there been any of that sort of division in Iceland? Well, yes, we've had a political and democratic discussion about the methods. But uh, if, if you look at the polls, you know, an overwhelming majority is really uh, very much in favor of the restrictions and the methods that we've been using. And actually it was also a decision from the very beginning that this shouldn't become a political issue. So, so what we have tried to do is to say, we are working very closely with the scientists, with the experts, uh, and we have followed their uh, advice very, pretty closely. And I think it has proven very beneficial for us. Uh, you could actually take this and, 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 and really learn from this experience when you're looking into other matters. I could mention climate, for instance, because it really is important to listen to scientists and build your decisions on positive evidence. And obviously that's very difficult when you're faced with a virus, which we really don't know a lot about. So, so it's been a quite a, you know, it's been an, a journey of uncertainty. And I think the most important thing is that we have been able to say, we really don't have all the answers. The politicians don't have all the answers. The experts don't have all the answers. We need to somehow find out uh, together what's the best way through this. And you are one of the most outspoken and, and uh, noted feminists in a position of government anywhere in the world. Um, so you will appreciate that there's been a lot of note that women leaders seem to have uh, 
emerged as very effective uh, responders to the, the pandemic. Is there a reason why uh, countries that have women prime ministers and, and, and leaders uh, have seemed to do so well? And we think of New Zealand and Iceland, Germany and other countries. Well, it's very tempting to say that women do everything best. It's very tempting to say that. <laughs> but I'm just going to say that, you know, it, from everything I've learned during my many years in politics, I've been for 13 years now in, in the Icelandic parliament. 13, not 30. <laughs> and obviously, you know, my experience is, is when you have both men and women at the table where decisions are made, you get better decisions. You get better decisions for society and economy. And, and you get also better decisions when you're faced with a crisis like the ones we're faced with now. And I think it's really uh, important uh, to, th to remember that gender equality is not something that you think about just when, when you have nothing else to do. It's actually vital to think about gender equality when you're faced with a crisis like this pandemic, and where which hits men and women very differently, and you get a different uh, set of views from men and women. So first and foremost, it's important to have both men and women at the table. Um, and I don't know, you know, I think maybe somebody should do a research on this. Maybe it's easier for women to sometimes just say, you know what, I admit that I don't know everything. It's a theory. <laughs> <laughs> and and it is, um, it's also something that you've talked a lot about, though. You, you have um, put, made gender equity a real focus of your governance. Mm -hmm. And you've also interacted with uh, women leaders from around the world. Um, and I know you were, you were very excited. Uh, I shouldn't say very excited. You noted on Twitter uh, when uh, Jacinda Ardern was uh, reelected uh, or won another election in New Zealand. Have you found yourself talking directly with other women leaders and other leaders around the world about the, the pandemic? Oh, yes. And, you know, in the Nordic countries, we actually have... Uh, four female prime ministers <laughs> so 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 that's quite a that you know and we have had a very close cooperation and and dialogue uh, through this crisis so yes definitely and and i think because you mentioned uh, the fact you know i think it's very important you know there are not so many of us women in leadership roles in the world when you think about the world uh, you know the whole world and if we've also learned, if you can take something and learn from it here in Iceland, is that women's solidarity across political parties is very important. That women must show solidarity, even though they are not in the same parties. And, you know, I would like to congratulate you on having actually the first woman now elected as vice president in the United States. It's an important, you know, it's an important thing for gender equality around the world. Well, I noted that uh, I do follow your Twitter feed, and uh, I noted that you you did an interesting thing after our U.S. election, hmm. uh, which, by the way, is still you know we still have some conflict regarding it and recounts and things. But uh, at the nation, we're pretty sure that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have indeed been elected, uh, and uh, I noted on in your response that you complimented and, and congratulated both Joe Biden and separately Kamala Harris, our new mm -hmm. vice president. And, and that isn't always done there. Often it's usually just the, the, the president gets the note. You went out of your way to, to compliment Kamala Harris or to note her election. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk to me about that a little bit. Well, it's part of the same thing that I mentioned. You know, I think, you know, I follow women around the world who are, you know, actually making that effort for gender equality. And I think actually showing that sol solidarity counts. And why do I say that? Yes, because uh, when I think about my own experience, uh, fight, because even though Iceland is at the top of the list of the World Economic Forum when it comes to gender equality, we still haven't reached that goal. We still aren't there that we can say here is gender equality because it isn't. It has to right now. Uh, as I was saying a moment ago, that we have, uh, we're, we're dealing with a new world here. 
where uh, these Zoom connections and internet connections can sometimes be challenging. And so we cut out for a moment, but we are back. And I can tell uh, folks who are watching from all over the US and around the world that we just had the most fascinating discussion <laughs> about you. Um, and, uh, but we promised to bring you back into all of it. When we, when we broke for a second there, uh, Prime Minister Jakob Stother was talking about why it is so important uh, to be strict in our measures and, and clear in our measures of progress for women uh, on issues of gender equality. And so if, if I might, I'll ask you to, to pick up again and, and uh, explain why it is, why it's so important, even when you have significant progress, as the United States has with uh, electing a woman as vice president, uh, as Iceland has with uh, having a woman prime minister, not the first, but uh, I believe the second you are, mm -hmm. uh, and so much other progress that, that we don't just pat ourselves on the back, but we also recognize the work we have to do. Yeah, well, uh First, I would like to say, you know, I think it's really part of the success of the Icelandic women's movement that that it's really that's this mentality that we always when we when we have some progress, we say that was great. And where will we go from here? So it, it's quite, a, you know, it's part of our attitudes, really, to to never to really cease thinking about how we can actually go on. And I think also it's very important to never to forget that you know, gender equality is not a given. Uh, even just the other day, we were talking about a new legislation on uh, gender equality in Iceland, mm -hmm. where uh, one of my fellow, uh, one of my fellow politicians said, well, do we have really time to talk about gender equality now when we're in this pandemic? Mm -hmm. uh, and my answer to that was that obviously we always should have the time to talk about gender equality. And maybe it has never been more important than now precisely in this pandemic when we're actually seeing uh, a backlash in gender equality around the world. We're seeing a surge in gender-based violence, domestic violence. People even talk about a pandemic when it comes to violence against women mm -hmm. uh, during this uh, outbreak of the coronavirus. So, so I think actually this is one of the issues that you probably never will be able to stop thinking about and talk about. And, and it's very good to have that mindset always. You also complimented uh, uh, President-elect Biden on his election and congratulated him. And I noted that in your, uh, in your message to them, and you've not spoken directly yet because uh, uh, President-elect Biden has not spoken to most world leaders yet, but in that, that initial communication, uh, you noted in particular that you were excited to talk to him and to be to work with him on issues of climate and human rights. Mm -hmm. And I know those have been great passions of yours. Uh, tell us about, uh, well, let me, let me frame it this way. It, the United States has withdrawn from the Paris uh, Accords and communications, uh, but is now expected to come back. Uh, I presume that to your mind, it's very, very important that the United States re-engage on these issues. You're presuming right, John, because obviously the United States of America is a very important player when it comes to international cooperation to fight the climate crisis. And I do sincerely hope that uh, the US will return to the Paris Agreement uh, because it's a very important, um, you know, I actually was there when this, uh, in Paris, when this agreement was made. And it was something that really gave us all a new hope uh, in the fight against the climate crisis. And we have been working uh, according to a very good plan here in Iceland and what we can do to actually achieve our goals in reducing carbon emissions and achieving carbon neutrality. Um, but obviously, the United States of America is such a big and important player in this uh, in this puzzle that it's very important to 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 if they are if the state the United States are going to be back at this table. And and when you talk about a, a very important uh, kind of focus and a very important plan as regards Iceland, you have in fact when you came to office, you sped up the process, or you mm -hmm. said you thought that you could achieve many of the goals faster 
and we're going to at least work on doing so. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, we have, you know, every actually, you know, I think we have every opportunity to have a lot of success in achieving our goals and reducing emissions. And what has happened here in Iceland is that we, this was one of our top priorities, uh, actually presenting a plan. We have updated that plan. We are working with different sectors in society. Uh, the, the two big projects that we began doing were actually an energy shift in the transport system, uh, introducing uh, new funding so that we can actually switch to electricity in, in, in our traffic system here in Iceland, and then also new project on carbon binding. But now we're actually working with all sectors. So, so we're thinking about and working on how we can introduce renewables in our fisheries fleets, uh, how we can increase the carbon binding by actually pumping, pumping carbon down into the earth, into the basalt layers in Iceland. So we are doing this by uh, great cooperation, but also with innovative methods. And I think uh, what has happened here is that we have, you know, all, you know, everybody has become so engaged in the issue of climate. And, and that's why I'm so optimistic that we will actually be able to, to you know, achieve the goals that we have set us. And it was environmental issues that drew you into politics initially, if I'm not mistaken. Initially, you, you were yes. kind of steered toward academia and, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously did, did teaching and, and lecturing, but, but there were environmental issues that, that drew you in and, and made you political. Yeah, you know, I was I was the person standing outside of the House of Parliament, you know, with a flag, <laughs> with a green flag, <laughs> demonstrating and and really and that that was actually yes, uh, my first steps in politics were actually outside the House of Parliament with my mother, who also stood there, and we were demonstrating uh, because. Uh, and the, my party, the Left Greens, was the first political party I ever joined because it was the first Green Party in Iceland, uh, a party that really spoke to me and, and my conviction. And tell me about, tell us a little bit about the Left Green Party and the Left, left Green Movement. Um, it is uh, not unique to Iceland. There are other countries that have uh, Left Green Movements across, uh, across the Nordic countries. But in Iceland, you had this, this break view breakthrough victory that brought you to the prime minister's position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, then again, you know, we're not the biggest party in Iceland uh, um, and, and probably never will be the biggest party in Iceland. Maybe, though, I hope. <laughs> Maybe someday <laughs> it will happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the left green movement, this really combines uh, very important, you know, I think it actually combines, you know, a, a very clear vision for the big challenges of the 21st century. And then I'm talking about equality, I'm talking about sustainability. Uh, and I think when you, when you look at uh, the big picture of the global politics, uh, I think these are the two, uh, these are the big issues that we need to tackle. It's the climate crisis, it's the inequality in the world, including gender equality, which has always been a very important factor for the left green movement. So I think, uh, I think when we think about the big challenges ahead, this is the movement that really uh, is built on the values that I think are the right values to move on into the future. And the left green movement, I've, I've been in Iceland and, and been at conferences that, that you have done. And, and one of the striking things about it is that it's, it's very focused on, on a deep issue discussion. Uh, your <laughs> maybe, long maybe more, meetings. <laughs> very long meetings, but also going very deep on the issues and having something that I think are very relevant for Americans, which is uh, that you take seriously formulating the policy and then having members of the movement bring that policy into governance. It's, it's not just a personality based uh, politics. It really is an issue driven. Absolutely right, actually. Uh, and this is obviously, you know, the, at least the left wing tradition in Iceland. It's all about really where everybody just sits 
in the same room uh, and the chair is there, but you know, and he's just one of the people of the party. And we all have really, we are all on this, in the same place when we're talking about the policy issues. Uh, and then we actually decide the policy in a room where people raise their hands and, and sometimes the chair loses. So that's really interesting to, to, to see if, you know, I've noticed that some of my foreign friends find that a little bit awkward that, the chair of the party can actually can actually lose a vote in a party, and that and I say that's because it is a movement, and we're actually having this discussion, and we're really participating together to form that policy. So, so I think this is quite a you know the culture of the left in Iceland, and we have always been also a party which focuses a lot on on you know let's get all the different experts together with us in the room, and let's hear them really have a long and deep conversation about different issues so it's been a you know it's a learning process also to be in uh, in the left and to participate in the left green movement and and i know that our you know some of my my friends from other political parties say oh my god these long meetings of you guys <laughs> you know they are they are known you know and it, the left green movement is also very internationalist and when you have gatherings you bring people from other countries to participate and to to advance that discussion. And Iceland has had a, a very internationalist tradition. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, uh, it, it, it's a small country, of course, but mm -hmm. it's also a country that, that kind of looks for ideas from other places and has also looked to lead over, over the years, not it, accepting that, that it may not have the largest population, but, but Iceland intends to be a part of the global discourse. Well, we think we are we are the center of the universe. You know, it happens when you're on island. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, I think it's you know uh, maybe because we're an island, we have always you know valued very much international cooperation. Uh, you know, when an Icelandic poet wrote you know, wrote a poem in the old times of the Icelandic sagas, he had to go to Norway and recite the poem. You know. It wasn't enough just to write a poem and then talk about it here in Iceland. He had to go to Norway and recite it for the king. So I think uh, when you look at our history, it's all about this international interaction. Uh, and somehow we are situated between uh, North America and Europe. And you can actually feel it in our way of life that we are a little bit a blend of those two cultural uh, uh, how can I put it? We talk about it from the terms of, of geology. There are two plateaus, the American plateau and the European plateau, and they are the reasons for earthquakes and, and volcanoes here in Iceland. But there are also two cultures that meet here in this country. Well, someone who's been very interested uh, for a long time in the role that Iceland has played in bringing uh, different countries together, uh, including the United States and the former Soviet Union is our uh, editorial director and mm -hmm. publisher, Katrina Bannenhubel. And I wanna bring her in for a moment uh, to have her uh, pose a question and also uh, extend our dialogue a little bit. Katrina Bannenhubel, please join us. This has been a fascinating conversation, thank you. You have spoken and you speak so powerfully about the existential crisis of climate, of climate change. There is another existential crisis and your country in October, 1986 was the site for a powerful possibility to end that existential crisis. I'm thinking of the summit, the Reykjavik summit between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, when there was a moment of possibility for the elimination of nuclear weapons, the abolition. Mm -hmm. And it really fell apart because Reagan had a fantasy, many reasons, but Reagan's fantasy of Star Wars was one he wasn't gonna let go of from his time in Hollywood onwards. Um, there's been interesting movement because the General Assembly, as you may know, this past month uh, ratified the uh, treaty on the elimination of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. But my question is, how, do you, how would you fuse the extraordinary energy we see globally around climate with the peril of, of uh, nuclear weapons? We're on the cusp of a new arms race. We hope uh, President-elect Biden will sign start the new start, which expires February 5th, which would dismantle the entire arms, quote, control 
universe. But how would you, as a leader, as a former organizer or someone outside parties of movements, advise those who care about the nuclear challenge to fuse with the energy of climate? Well, I think it's a very important topic that you raised there. And, and because we were talking about climate and, and the urgency of the climate crisis, I think maybe uh, the urgency of the nuclear crisis uh, hasn't been so much in the debate or maybe less in the debate in the debate than it should be because we are actually in a, in a very precarious moment when it comes to nuclear disarmament and I think uh, this is an issue I have actually raised uh, at NATO meetings uh, where you get the chance to talk about to talk to the leaders of the NATO states because this is I think one of the most important issues to ensure peace and security in the world to get uh, nuclear disarmament back on top of our priorities list. And I do hope that, that uh, this sense of urgency, uh, we can actually mediate that uh, to the world because we are seeing a, a development that hasn't been in the right direction in the last few years when it comes to disarmament. Right. Could I ask you, because you're a new thinker about institutions, about internationalism, there was once an idea of a kind of common European home, which would de-escalate militarization of Europe from, say, Lisbon to Vladivostok. Um, there was, at one point, a robust discussion about NATO. What role do you think NATO plays today? Is there a, a militarization of our foreign policy because NATO is so central? Or do you feel it's of value to a country like Iceland? Well, you know, Iceland was actually one of the founding members of NATO, but still we are a nation that has no army. And yeah. you're talking to a prime minister that belongs to a party that, that is. actually is against the membership of NATO, the only party in Iceland. So, so it, but we have uh, decided in, in the current government coalition to stay true to the, to the, um, result that the Icelandic parliament got, because this has been discussed in the Icelandic parliament and follow the national security policy that the parliament agreed upon and the membership of NATO is, is one of the cornerstones of that policy. Uh, but I think also NATO is uh, a place and that's why I chose to talk about nuclear disarmament right. at, the, at the later meeting of NATO, because I think it's, you know, there we have the, the people who can actually make very important decisions when it comes to disarmament. Yes. And, and it is a, that is a, a, a subtlety of your, of your role because your party has been critical of NATO. Um, and as you say, you've accepted that, that reality that, that you are a leader of government who, who works with NATO still opposed to Iceland's uh, participation as a party. Yeah. Why is your party opposed to participation in NATO? Well, um, it's always been really a fundamental in our policy. We are a pacifist party. <laughs> and and uh, so that's, uh, this has been actually a part of our policy from it was founded in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we want to really uh, accentuate actually this uh, which I think is really quite unique, the fact that we are a nation without an army. And I think actually, according to some measurements, the most one of the most peaceful countries in the world. Well, that brings us to, uh, if we have a few more minutes and if you can stick with us for a few minutes, we have some a lot of questions from people who are um, viewing. And you will be impressed, perhaps, that, uh, that though this is an American, predominantly American audience, all the questions are about Iceland. <laughs> okay. So everybody's very interested in Iceland. Um, sometimes filtered through our own. You're experience. all very welcome when we manage uh, to, when, we, when we'll begin to travel again. Then you're all very welcome. Ne next year in Iceland. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> next nation festival in Iceland. Um, let me ask a couple of those questions, if I might. Uh, yeah. And Katrina, do feel free, Katrina Vanderhoof, but feel free to jump in at any Thank point you. if you've got Thanks. stuff to add here. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the questions that relates to challenges in the U.S. Uh, it comes from uh, Chuck Carlson, who says, there are a lot of discussions 
of improving police oversight in the United States. How does police oversight work in Iceland and what lessons might activists in the US learn from that experience? Police oversight, uh, then you're referring to? If I, I, but tell us a little bit about policing in general. I, I've written about this some. Yeah, I've written about it some in Iceland. And for instance, uh, I think your officers have to ask for permission to use their gun or to, they have to- They don't have guns usually. Right. Yeah. Police so officers, that, that's quite an exception, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, obviously it's difficult to compare countries uh, and, you know, we have relatively few violent crimes, but our police are generally don't carry arms and, and they are, I think uh, we think a little bit about the police as uh, a very important sector of our society um, and they enjoy a lot of confidence here in Iceland, uh, which is very important, uh, actually a very important factor to keep the country safe, but they don't carry arms, no. Uh -huh. and, um, and if there is a, a police interaction with uh, an individual that does not have a positive result, if there is a, a, a conflict, mm -hmm. how is that resolved? Do you do you have a uh, an oversight panel? Do the courts come in? What's the what's the way to make sure that police do follow the rules and do? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there 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 are some uh, procedures concerning that, and I think actually when I look back in the last few years, I think we've had one one case actually of a person who was killed in a police operation. And I think that's, I, when I look back 10 years, I think there is actually a one incident in that because, uh, and I think it's actually just one, uh, and I think you don't have to look back 10 years. I think it's just, you know, the history of the Iceland. The whole people. history of Iceland, yeah. yeah. I think it's <laughs> the only, I think it's the only example actually. So we have procedures uh, concerning that, but obviously the police don't carry weapons uh, as a rule, and they only do so if they are actually confronted with a situation where we have uh, a person who is also carrying a weapon. But then again, you know, people just don't carry weapons around here in Iceland, and I'm very happy about that because <laughs> <laughs> I have a very strong opinion on that, actually. <laughs> and your opinion part of is? Being a, it's part of being a very peaceful country. <laughs> Not not have everybody carrying weapons around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are there are many Americans who share your view. Uh, yeah, yeah, I um, know, you know, and it's a very relevant issue for you. It is. Let me. Uh, Robin Lee uh, asks, uh, "What are the Prime Minister's thoughts uh, on uh, how green left activists build bridges with both voters and politicians?" Who are resistant to your ideas for change? Your ideas. Uh, well, you know, well, you know how, how to build bridges in general. I think that's a that's it's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge in uh, society, which we are seeing that has you know society has become more polarized. And and that's true in Iceland as well. Yeah, I think it applies to every Western country. You know, we're seeing with the use. You know, the social media is actually showing us a very limited uh, part of the world uh, so you so you are you're always really stuck in your social media bubble and mm -hmm. and that obviously has that effect on your mind that you think that everybody agrees with you and then you're very surprised when you lose the election <laughs> and you really don't understand what happened so I, so i totally connect and i think this really raises uh, new challenges when it comes to building bridges and making compromises mm -hmm. now it's a very different issue for us here in Iceland where we always have coalition governments and uh, we don't have this system where there's one party in government so we have to build bridges but obviously it was a very controversial decision that I made when we decided to form a government with political parties on the center but also on the right in the political sphere and I think it's a very good thing to do exactly that in the times of increased polarization, because it is possible to build bridges and dialogue is the first step to do that. And this is an interesting question about different uh, models of government and different uh, structures for government. Do you think being forced to form coalitions, uh, obviously I, I presume you'd, you'd love it if you could just come to power and have your party you know, govern on its own, but is there a value to being forced to form a coalition? and to, to pull people together across lines of disagreement? 
Well, I think, you know, every politician uh, has a dream of, you know, being just with you know, the majority of the votes and can have, you know, and can actually form a government with one party. But then you actually have the different opinions within the party. So I don't think that solves anything. And often it's, I think actually having to form a coalition is it's a learning process, not just for politicians, but also for society. And, and, but I think also in this increased polarization, people are becoming, it's, it's, it's becoming more difficult to make compromises. So, so it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, it, the uh, Robin who, who put that question in did also want us to say on a personal note, please let her know she is an absolute inspiration to millions of women like me. So <laughs> there's one of those compliments that you Thank don't you. like. Oh uh, <laughs> Dan Rink asks, uh, can you address the citizen driven constitutional reform initiative in Iceland from several years ago? What happened with that and why? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I was in government when that happened, and it was actually an, an initiative uh, from the citizens, which the current, which the government back then, which was the government of the left green movement and the social democrats, actually took uh, and and uh, and uh, worked on for several years. But uh, that reform wasn't finished in parliament. Uh, and then we had a new election and a new government, so there, there wasn't a, a majority. After having, a, a, well, at least we did, there, wasn't, there was no certainty that the reform did have a majority in parliament, and that's why it wasn't finished. But I have actually been working now on amendments to the constitution in Iceland, building on a lot of that work that was done back then. Uh, but doing it very pragmatically, pragmatically because you have to have a majority in a parliament to have a constitutional amendment, and then you have to have an election, and then again, a majority in the parliament. So it's not an easy task to change the Icelandic constitution. Is there anything major you're doing to change the constitution? I do hope that we will uh, actually agree on some changes of the constitutions before the next election, which is in next September. Uh, and I'm, you know, and obviously coming from a green party, I'm hoping that we will have actually an amendment concerning the environment in our constitution. So I'm working on that. Ooh, would that protect the environment? Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, we have a lot of questions about Iceland's geothermal status, which ah. tells you about our tells you about our our uh, our readers and, and folks who are engaged with this. And um, uh, one of them says. Uh, we all know that geothermal about geothermal energy use in Iceland. So right off the bat, because we all know about that, <laughs> we're a somewhat self-selected group. Um, have you in Iceland been exploring other sources as well uh, as part of a national energy policy uh, of renewable energies? Well, we use so. geo yeah we use geothermal both for heating our houses but also to produce electricity. So geothermal, you know, we heat our houses mainly with geothermal. Uh, we also use that to produce electricity. Our main source of electricity is using hydropower. Uh, and now we're actually experiencing with wind and how, and I gather actually that the Icelandic wind <laughs> blows so heavy that there might be very big opportunities actually in using, uh, harnessing wind energy here in Iceland. And we can learn a lot from our neighbors uh, from that. So that's, that's something that we're working on also. But we're also thinking about all sorts of renewables because we think you really need to, uh, you have, you know, renewables isn't something, some one issue which the government decides we need to really innovate, use innovation and research to get different sorts of renewable energy to replace the fossil fuel, uh, mm -hmm. the fossil fuel driven uh, sector. We have a lot of questions from people who are interested in uh, what you were saying about COVID-19 and the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. We just have a couple minutes left. So uh, yeah. I will um, uh, just sum it up in uh, one that it, do you, in America, we're talking about a Green New Deal, about coming yeah. out, uh, about really making a great leap forward where we link a lot of our economics to um, addressing the climate. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that the COVID crisis and, and the climate crisis coming at the same time, does it give us an opportunity 
to go for big, bold responses coming out of this moment that might, you know, not merely kind of restart economies coming out of COVID, but also start to really solve problems that we have been left unaddressed, not just, not just in Iceland, but around the world? Yeah. Is this a, maybe a critical juncture where we can kind of get to another place? I think we have every opportunity to accelerate this green transformation, uh, to build back better and greener, we say <laughs> on this side <laughs> of the Atlantic. And, and I think actually we have a lot, you know, what we're doing right now because of the economic crisis is that we are investing in infrastructure. And uh, when I talk about infrastructure, I'm also talking about research. I'm talking about innovation. I'm talking about energy shift. I'm talking about the circular economy. We are actually investing, investing in uh, infrastructure that will make us make it possible to accelerate uh, to accelerate this green transformation. So I think it's absolutely vital that we are, you know, th you know, we're not supposed to say the economy that went into this crisis shouldn't be the same economy that comes out of it. We should use actually this crisis to accelerate this development. Let's cl conclude by talking just for a moment about uh, your great passion, which is uh, Icelandic crime fiction. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, and Katrina asked when we were in that little, uh, in the uh, interlude other world uh, off, off screen, uh, Katrina Van Hoovel asked you if you're still writing, and you said that you don't get to write very much, but that you are um, you are enthusiastic about writing uh, at some point. And yeah, uh, yeah. I haven't that. written any crime fiction. Let's be <laughs> quite honest about that. I have written about crime fiction a lot, and of course, as you mentioned earlier, I tended to become a scholar, and and. Actually, I love being a politician, but I even love more to teach and and educate. This is that's a passion also for me. But I have this dream of writing a crime novel, and now I actually have a plan because I have a friend who is actually a real crime <laughs> fiction author, you know, a professional, not an amateur like me. And we're actually planning to write a book together. He is way ahead because I seem to have no time for anything but being a prime minister. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a handful actually. So I'm hoping, you know, one day this will happen. And we have, you know, we have a plot outline. And does that outline- prime minister, someone, oh, someone may write a novel about you before you write your crime <laughs> fiction. Well, I, I actually, hope you're taking notes. <laughs> taking notes for the- uh... I, I should be taking notes, you know, but, you know, I'm always talking about that this will happen one day uh, yeah. and probably this will be the last thing that happens. <laughs> but this will happen though. I will write soon. And I always continue to re read crime fiction, you know. I, I read every Icelandic crime novel that's published so, because I want just to, to stay, uh, stay, on, stay on my old career a little bit. Let me ask this the last question. Um, uh, when I was with you in Reykjavik a few years ago, uh, you, uh, Lara, your, your great aide said, oh, well, uh, the prime minister is going to be doing something tonight. I asked her, are there going to be any community events? Are you doing any speeches or things in the, in, in around the country that I could go and, and cover you doing? She said, well, she's doing something a little different. Um, she's going to go give a lecture on women in Icelandic literature. Um, <laughs> And if I recall, it was in the basement of a uh, of a, a community center of a of a place there, and it was packed. There was a whole crowd of people, and you delivered uh, the better part of a two hour lecture with friends and allies, and people providing music and uh, and readings uh, on the role of women in Icelandic fiction as the prime minister of the country. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of Americans, that was that was a jarring concept that a leader of government, a leading figure in government um, would, would be so focused on and take the time uh, to explore and prepare a lecture on, on, on a literary issue, also on one that involves gender and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, but as I recall, you, you think of that as, as, as really a, a part of the role of, mm -hmm. of a leader is to, to know literature and to engage with uh, ideas. And talk, give us a little thought on that. 
Well, you know, now I can't really recall what I told you back then. But I think <laughs> <laughs> now having uh, done this job now for, wow, quite, you know, three years, right? Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> and I think it's very important for politicians and leaders to, to not to forget that they're also just normal people. Uh, mm. I think that's maybe one of the biggest issues for uh, politicians and leaders, uh, not to forget where they come from. I come from this sector, I come from the literature sector, but I also just come from the normal Icelandic society. So I still, you know, every Saturday I go out and, and shop, you know, go to the grocery store and buy the food and meet people and people saying, oh, she's buying this, check what my, I have in my basket and all that. Mm -hmm. And it's just part of being a normal person. And, and I think this is what I value so much about Icelandic society is that we who are in politics, we are allowed to just continue to be exactly this. And I think, I think this is part of just, you know, holding on to your humanity and your personality through all of this. And I, you know, I think that can be quite a challenge and not least in bigger countries like your big country. So this is one of the things that I'm so grateful for to live in a society that works like this. John, could I just say prime minister, I can't think of a better way to launch this festival. Your words are so deeply inspiring and so human. And that's what we need in politics and uh, our work. But oh, turn it over to John, that was a beautiful interview. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katrina Vanderhoeven for joining us. And, and thank you, uh, prime minister Katrina Jakob's daughter of Iceland for giving us this much time. Uh, I agree with Katrina there couldn't be a better way to start a festival of this sort uh, because you take us beyond uh, just the experience of our country to think of it in a global perspective. And uh, I know that from the questions and comments we got from people, uh, they were really thrilled to hear from you. So again, thank you so much. Thank and you. and uh, we hope that we'll continue to maintain this relationship uh, between the nation and uh, both you and, and Iceland. Thank you so much. And both of you, it was great having Thank this you. conversation. It's my pleasure.